Silvius Traders Lounge in partnership with Scope Markets welcome you to yet another webinar where we learn, trade and profit. We shall be giving you trading insights on technical analysis, fundamental analysis, risk management and trading psychology. Today's guest is Jeremy Newsom and our theme is how to trade stocks and take advantage of price gaps. Hello, Jeremy. I hope you've had your morning coffee because we're going to have like a long, long webinar session. Let's do it. I'm ready. I'm All right. Ready. I'm going to start by doing your bio, your trading bio, and then we can get right to the questions and engage with the audience. We've been eagerly waiting. And yeah, I'm happy to do this again with you. Right? Yeah, likewise. Likewise. This is going to be a lot of fun. So thank you. Cool. Jeremy Alexander Newsup is the CEO and co-founder of www.reallifetrade.com. He has one of the fastest growing audiences and websites on the internet and attacks the markets with an energy, exuberance and humor that is truly refreshing. He has been professionally trading the stock market since 21 years of age. That should be, I think, a decade plus, right? And Jeremy specializes in candlesticks, gaps, credit spreads, day, and swing trading. Welcome aboard, Jeremy. Thank you so much for having me, man. And I do apologize again about having to rearrange this, but thank you for making it convenient. And it's, uh, it's an honor and privilege to be here. Oh, well, cool. We understand. So maybe we can start off by you telling us, because now we have a Kenyan audience and a global online audience. Just start by telling us like how you found your path into trading US equities and how you've managed to grow a community of traders globally. Uh, you know, a well-established community of traders with real life trading. Yeah, absolutely. That's a very great question. I appreciate you asking. So I'll kind of give you a little bit about my background. I grew up in the United States uh, in the state called Georgia. So it's south of Tennessee, north of Florida, and I grew up very financially poor. Uh, my family just didn't have that much money. And uh, I was watching a movie that probably all of you have heard of and you've most likely watched. It's called Forrest Gump. Have you heard of that? Have you watched that, Sylvia? Yes. Yeah, so Forrest Gump, watched that movie. It's still to date, my favorite film. And about 76% of the way through the movie, Forrest Gump starts recounting his life. And he starts talking about all the things that he's done and all the things he's accomplished. And he says that Lieutenant Dan invested in a fruit company and they no longer had to worry about money anymore. That was like a paradigm shift for me because at the time I was six years old, this was 1994, and I had never heard the phrase, we never had to worry about money anymore, right? That was just something that I'd never heard those words because, you know, we, had, we worried about money a lot. Yeah. And, you know, where we, where we were gonna eat that day or the bills or how we were gonna go or travel or, or get gas or whatever, like everyone was in my family very worried about money. And so I asked, I asked my dad, what is investing and what is the Apple company? So he told me a little bit about the stock market and he told me a little bit about Apple computers and uh, how Apple works and how, you know, they sell products. And I was like, well, you should just simply do what Forrest Gump did, right? Let's go buy some shares of Apple. And he's like, son, two things. Like, you know, this is a movie and it doesn't work that way, right? Everything you watch in movies isn't real. And number two, uh, Money doesn't grow on trees. You can't just go out and just get money and invest in the stock market. So at the time I, this was, I learned years and years later, but at the time what I had to do was become resourceful. A lot of people in their lives will be struggled and frustrated with trying to achieve something. So in life, it's not your resources that determine your outcome. It's your resourcefulness because all of us have a limited resource in our hands. Like we, you know, we have a limited resource in our bank account. We have limited resource um, of time. We have limited resources, but you know, limited resources of energy, you have to sleep physically. So there's only so much you can do. 
So at the time I was six, I had no money, obviously. I had no job. <laughs> I had no bank account. I didn't really know anything. So I was walking up and down the road one day. It was a dirt road, still a dirt road to this day. And I was picking some blackberries. I was eating them. And I thought, you know what? Other people might like this. I wonder if I can make some money from selling blackberries, right? Those little berries on a bush. So that's exactly what I did. I picked blackberries. I sold them door to door and I raised $1,300 that summer. And, uh, um, my dad ended up matching me that money. Uh, come to find out that he actually borrowed it from my uncle, but you know, not a big deal. So we bought 2,600 US dollars worth of Apple in 1994. And uh, that was kind of the start of my investing career. I had no idea the implications and how ironic it is and just really otherworldly that that particular investment would have made sure that I no longer had to worry about money ever again. <laughs> so that's kind of how it initially started. Brilliant. Now, uh, the transition, I remember the first interview we did with you, you were working at a corporate before going uh, retail to trading your own money. Like, can yeah. you also go back to that and tell Kenyans like the beauty about retail trading? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and what's important is a lot of people, they want to quit their job immediately as soon as they find out about trading. And I can't say that I didn't have that feeling, but you do have to be smart about it. Um, because if you start trading for only income initially, you are going to experience an anxiety and, and kind of a fear that you might not have experienced before. So trading uh, retail for me was exciting because it gave me the opportunity to do things I couldn't do inside of my corporate job. I actually liked my job a lot. Uh, I, I still like the company. It's an insurance company. They're very profitable. They do great. I have tons of connections at the company still. I, and I'm, I was happy with my time there, but it kind of held me down a little bit, right? You had a dress code. <laughs> <laughs> That was weird, you know, like I got to wear certain things. I got in trouble once, Sylvia, uh, for wearing, have you seen the movie Dumb and Dumber with Jim Carrey? Yes. So do you remember those uh, tuxedos, like the light blue and the light orange tuxedos? Well, I lived in the city of Gainesville, Florida at the time. And uh, the, the team there is the Gators and their color is blue and orange. So I figured this is the perfect thing to buy. So I bought both of those tuxedos. <laughs> and, and warm to work. And I caused a really big stir. Um, I didn't wear both of the exact same day, obviously, but uh, I caused a big stir and management got in, on to me because it wasn't breaking any of their dress code rules, but you know, I was distracting people. So now they had to rewrite the rules that said you can, you also can't wear any outlandish and distracting material or garb. That was what they put in into the additional rules. Anyway, so working in this company, you know, I had certain things I just I didn't like to do. First of all, I had to drive. Okay. I don't like traffic at all. Like traffic jams. Is there bad traffic in Kenya? Very, like a two hour drive to the CBD. Oh no. Yeah. Oh my goodness. That's, <laughs> yeah. So driving, that was like the number 417 of why I didn't want to work. I didn't want to drive to work. Um, that was a big one, you know, just, just that amount of time too. So I didn't think about it, but I mean, that's, that's your time. That's your life going to and from. That was a big reason for me. But the real big thing that did it was I'll, I'll kind of tell you the story of how I learned about the specific market itself. Because when I invested, I didn't know anything, but I knew I wanted to make money. But as I got older, I was 19, right around 19 going on 20. And I sat down with one of my bosses who just emailed me actually about a week ago. His name is Rob. And he was doing a peer review 
one of those, you guys all know what peer reviews are. Anyway, so we sat down and on his computer screen, I could tell that he had something stock market related. Didn't know what it was, but I said, hey, Rob, all due respect, man, give me whatever grade you want during this peer review. I want to know what that is. Tell me everything you know about that. Because at the time I was in college and I was working on getting a finance degree. And I'm sure your universities are the same as ours. They don't really focus on the stock market. They don't really talk about finances in a way that you can become financially free. They mm -hmm. talk about the really big picture, boring stuff like coupon yield rates and <laughs> bonds and accounting and i'm like this yeah. is lame so they definitely don't teach forex right i know your your community is huge into forex they don't teach anything about that and i just wanted to learn it so i asked rob and uh, he told me a strategy called uh, covered calls and in essence that strategy is very simple it's you buy a hundred shares of a company that you like it's a good company it could also be an etf you buy a hundred shares of it and then you sell a call a few strikes higher than the stock that you buy. And what you're in essence doing, Sylvia, is you are renting out your shares. So if you buy a stock at a hundred and you sell a 105 covered call, you're going to get paid to do that. And if the stock goes up to 105, you sell your shares at 105 and receive a 5% return on your money plus the money that you got for selling the call, which is you know normally very small, but it can be around 1% sometimes. So you're looking at a 6% gain. And if the stock goes down, you keep your rent money and you keep your shares and you can do it again next month. And I was like, man, this sounds exactly like renting a house. And Rob said, it is. And I was like, well, what's the risk? He goes, the risk is if the stock goes down, right? He's like, but if you buy a good company and you hold it long enough, you're probably going to make money. I was like, man, that's so interesting. I was like, okay, cool. Let me do that. So that's what I started doing. And uh, it worked really, you know, exceedingly, exceedingly well. The very first stock that I purchased, semi knowing what I was doing, this was my investment strategy, Sylvia. So for everyone who's listening, this was all I did to make $3,000. I went into Google and I typed in which silver companies to buy. <laughs> And because of SEO, you know, the very first one that came up was, yeah, it, the very first one that came up was First Majestic Silver, uh, ticker symbol AG. So that was the very first one that pops up. That's all the research I did. Clicked on it, read a, like eight seconds about the company. I was like, cool. I went into my 401k and I uh, had eventually a week or two before converted everything from a regular 401k to a self-directed 401k. It's a very important step. But most people in their 401k, they have like a target retirement date yeah. or something, some type of fund that they're buying and their money is spread out into like 15 different things. And I have a question for you in a second, Sylvia. But when, when I did that, I just converted it to a self-directed 401k. And then I bought shares of First Majestic Silver. Uh, I bought about 900 shares around $12. And then I sold it at 15, which was a $3 per share gain. And I made like $2,700 um, in a month. Yeah, that was insane. And that was more money than I made at work. You know, like 2,700 US dollars was more than I made at work at the time. And no one had ever told me that I, that I right, not them, but I could make more money than you know, trading the stock market, then I made it work. And that was just, that was another huge paradigm shift. And from there, my life has never been the same. This is all I've done. This is all I've wanted to do. This is all I've read, you know, for the vast majority of my years. This is every webinar that I watched online. You guys are watching me. That's all I did was just this. What you guys are doing right now was studying and listening and asking questions and reading and all that kind of all right, Jeremy, uh, you mentioned something about your trading strategy and how that has e evolved over time. Can you like tell us about, talk to us more about, you know, your edge with gap trading? 
uh, and then also maybe you can explain what credit spreads are when you're trading us equities yeah totally i can do both those things um yeah. what's your 401k called in uh, kenya by the way nssf the retirement fund for public servants yeah yep yeah gotcha 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 okay so i'll just i just want to know because i try to I try to learn each country's like code. <laughs> Everyone has their own little code. Um, yeah, you know, that's the thing is I actually still do long-term investing. I love long-term investing. And I will tell everyone my personal belief. I like Forex and I like day trading, but I think they're for cash generation, right? You get, you get in, you take a trade, you create cash, but Forex, very, very rarely do you get a company that grows or a, a currency that changes 300% in a few months or years. It's quite rare, but it can happen in stocks, right? Companies, because when, when, a, when person, when people buy more of a company, what they're doing in essence is that company receives more money, right? And when a, when a company receives more money, they reinvest it into their company, right? Hire employees, buy buildings, research and development. All this money is coming in, they're doing things with it. So what does that do? It grows the value of the company, which does what? Grows the value of the stock, right? It's just like, holy smokes. Okay, so I can buy a newer company, a newer age company that's growing, that's doing something great with their money. And if I buy it at a good price and I hold it long enough and I you know, research the company, there's a strong chance I'm going to win. And the answer is, yeah, and you can win large. And that's incredible because you're owning a piece of a company that's churning and burning. It's making money while you sleep. And that's how you become wealthy. So I love the long-term investing game. I think it's an incredible way to achieve financial freedom. I think everyone should own a piece of a company and it doesn't matter how big the piece is, but you can get your pie or you can get your little sliver of pies. Doesn't, it's not as expensive as most people think. And from that, what I like to do is actually take that analysis, like the big, fast growing, exciting companies, and then scale down to smaller timeframes for cash generation. So it's a company that I already know and follow. For example, like Tesla. Tesla has been one of the strongest stocks on the entire US stock market for the last six months. And I've been extremely bullish on it since June of last year. Um, and we were watching it, we've been trading it. I know exactly how they make money. I love their products. I see a lot of people demanding their products, their, their products and their company and their industry are revolutionary and game changing and disrupting and their CEO is a mad genius. And there's so many aspects of the company that I liked a lot when they were back at 190 a share. Okay, so now they're at 640 a share, but that's like seven months later, right? That's that. So I mean, so you're talking to three, 300 short period of time. That's unheard of on a massive multiple. So what you can do is you can find these companies that are moving that are growing, that have a nice trend, and you can zoom down and trade them. And so my main strategy, my main focus is number one, finding a stock that's in a good trend. Right. So a, a stock that you can pull up on a shorter time frame. Uh, so I say shorter time frame, I mean the last few days or weeks and go, yep, that stops going up really nicely or going down really nicely. Like, okay, cool. From there, I analyze the individual candlesticks. So the individual candlesticks tell you a story. If you can read them, you can understand what the story is saying. And the story is how people, how investors like you, Sylvia, and me, how, how investors are feeling about a particular stock. You can read that story. Now, just like any other story or movie, if you read it, you don't necessarily know the ending until the ending happens, right? It could be like a movie where you're like, whoa, I didn't see that coming, that's crazy. And that's okay, but you can still read up to that point and then boom, then the stock market does whatever it does. And that's all right, all right, cool. I'm either a loser or I'm gonna win. But the candles do tell you the, the story, the foundation. And as you're reading this, what I like to look for is a gap. 
So in your, um, in your question, you're kind of saying like, what, what, what is a gap and how do you play it? So a gap is simply a change in price. We're going to get a lot of gaps on the U.S. market this morning when the market opens in two hours, two hours and 15 minutes. Um, the reason we're going to get a lot of gaps is because, you know, you're having a lot of issues with the coronavirus and, and the market was also at all time highs. And so you're getting a little bit of selling. You're getting a natural correction. You're getting an actual amount of selling, which is perfect. So my thought is I'm looking for people who were scared ex or really excited. So really scared or really excited with a gap in overnight price. So Facebook is a good example for right now today, Facebook reported earnings. And yesterday, Facebook was at like 220 and some change. Right now, as of like this exact second in time, Sylvia, Facebook is at 207. So you have $13 in difference, right? 220 to 207, that's a gap. It's a gap in price. And how do you think people feel who bought at like 219 or 218 or 216? Well, they're mad. They're mad, they're upset, they're worried, they're terrified, they're scared. And they're most likely gonna panic at market open and they're gonna sell. And if they sell and you have a lot of people selling, what's gonna to happen to the price of the stock? It's gonna go down. And as you know, you can make money regardless of what direction the market goes, up or down, right? That's yeah. the piece they never teach in the, in the school. You can only make money when the stock goes up. No, you can make money if it goes up or down or check this out, also sideways. And that's where credit spreads come in. So credit spreads, I, ha I had the distinct pleasure of being one of the only traders that I've ever met who is very well versed in only day, tra in day trading stocks and day trading options as well as advanced option strategies like credit spreads or calendar spreads, uh, diagonals, things of that nature. A credit spread in essence, options, stock options are insurance on stock. That's what they are. And you only have two types of insurance. You have a put option. So a put option in the stock market world is insurance for a stock when the stock goes down which is amazing because again, the lower the stock goes, the higher your insurance contract goes. So you can literally insure a stock. I tell people that, you know, not your group, your group probably knows this, but like brand new groups, Sylvia, if I go to uh, like school, I go to school every March for kids month and I'll teach kids this stuff. And the teachers and the kids are, they're mind blown when you learn that you can buy insurance on the stock. No one ever talks about that but you can buy an insurance contract, just like you can insure your car, your house, you know, your health, your life, you can insure your shares. So a put option is protecting you in case the stock goes down. And a call option is protecting you in case a stock goes up because there are some people that bet against the stock market. There are people who bet against the market going higher and they make money when the stock goes down. So a call option protects traders who are shorting Put option protects traders who are buying shares. All right. So a credit spread is when you sell an option, you receive money. So you sell an insurance contract. This is mind blowing stuff, but you can make money on the US stock market by selling something you don't even own. Now, when you sell an option, you have risks associated with that option. So what you do is you buy another insurance contract to protect yourself if something bad happens. And what you receive is a net credit. You receive a difference in price. And when you receive the difference in price, that's known as a credit and it's a spread because you have two different options. So normally the credit spread I like the most has a specific name. It's called a bull. So bull for bullish, it's called a put, P-U-T, because I'm selling puts, and it's a called, you know, a spread, a credit spread. So bull put spread. That is when you sell a put option, and then you buy a put option lower, and the net difference is oftentimes a credit that can be pretty nice 
return on your risk. I mean, you're talking like somewhere between 12 and 20% usually. If you find a good credit spread, you can get 12 to 20% risk on capital. And, you know, your risk on that particular trade, 12% return, but your probabilities of winning normally are north of 70%. Uh, if you do good analysis and you, you know, study well and you sell it at the right time at the right price, you can get that probabilities as high as the high 90s. So you're talking 98, 99% of the time you can win on a trade that has 12 to 20% return on risk. That's a pretty great strategy. And it's a lot of fun and it's pretty easy to do actually. All right. Thank you for even going into options because one of our attendees had a question about options and I think you've done a very good explanation on that. And uh, oh. maybe just following up on that, you, you said like um, the candlesticks tell the story, yeah? Yep. And that's how you're able to like also know how the markets are trending. So maybe you can go a little bit more into, you know, why price action, why technical analysis for you? Why is it like for you? What do you normally look for in your prep time? Uh, and then also in your analysis as an one as an intraday trader and also as a swing trader. Mm, OK. So one of the things that I love to look for, um, I, I'll answer your your beginning, your basic question when you said why, kind of like why technical analysis. For me, given the opportunity that you can visualize what the stock market is doing is insane. And it's really rare for people to know that that happens. For example, if you take me back 15 years ago and tell me, that I can visualize what the stock market is doing on a day to day or minute or minute, uh, week to week, or I, I can literally see how it's moving. I would not have believed you because that's just something that no one ever talks about, right? No one really ever discusses, but it's so mysterious to people. They don't know that you can pull up your phone and use many various apps to go, Oh, this is what the stock is doing. And you can see it. I mean, it's crazy. So technical analysis, I simply think helps the trader kind of be able to see what they're doing so they can formulate a plan. You don't have to see what you're doing before you formulate a plan, but most people like to kind of get a general idea. For example, if you're gonna go on vacation and you're gonna stay at a hotel, normally you try to look at some pictures of the hotel, right? You look at the outside, you look at some of the rooms, does it have a hot tub? Like you're trying to look at some stuff and figure out, is this a cool hotel or not? Is this something shady or is this nice? Um, or any other vacation you take, like if you just take a trip, you know, and you want to go somewhere, you're going to look around, you're going to try to see what it looks like. Most people, not everyone. But even then you can do even more, right? You can take a Google map and you can drop one of the orange guys, you know, and drop where you want to go and you can actually see the surrounding areas with Google Maps. I mean, it's amazing what you can do like that, but a lot of, some people will do that. So you have a difference. You have some people who will just book a vacation going, all right, cool, I'm going to Kenya and that's it. They don't look at anything else. And then you have the people who will zoom in and actually look at the street and find out where they wanna go and where they wanna eat. And they'll look at the menu ahead of time. They'll put it in a worksheet. So technical analysis can be really fun for people who are both artistic who like to be able to read music and play instruments and they just kind of feel things and they have a really good intuition. Traders like that can do extremely well. Um, it's also very good for the analytical engineer, very structured. I need to see everything before I take action type of people. So some of my favorite pieces of technical analysis are individual candlesticks. Um, I could give you two one of those candlesticks I call a high wave candle. It's not my definition, but it, it can be Googled, right? So if you type in high, H-I-G-H, wave, W-A-V-E, candle, um, tons of images come up. So a high wave candle is an indecision candle, pretty much. But it's a little bit bigger than a doji. So a doji candle is also an indecision candle, but it's tiny. It's like really, really small. So I can, I see a lot of times like you have this doji candle and then it kind of break out two or three different times and then go in your direction. A high wave candle is a little bit bigger. 
So you have even more indecision. And when you have even more indecision, you're kind of thinking to yourself, okay, well, pretty indecisive on this one. I think I'm going to take a trade. And then when that dis indecision becomes decision, you get a really good move. So that's why I like finding high wave candles in Forex, in cryptocurrencies, in futures, in stocks and options. I like looking and finding these high wave candles at the right place at the right time, because if I find them, they offer really good risk rewards, they offer really good setups and they're super simple. Uh, the other candle that I like a lot, Sylvia kind of looking for both swing trading and intraday. So that's kind of what I'm talking about here is I'm answering both your questions. So swing trading and intraday, the sh you know, shorter term time frames, a little bit of longer time time frames. I'm looking for high wave candles where you get that indecision and I'm looking for hammer candles. So a hammer candle, uh, I wish I had a hammer here, but it, look, it looks gym, just like a hammer, right? You're, you, you have something that you're holding it with and then you, you know, you, you have like a, a, the candle looks like a hammer. So it has a little bit of a lower shadow has a small body and sometimes I like it to have a little bit of an upper shadow. So a nice lower shadow candle body and a little bit of an upper shadow. And again, if you go to Google and type in hammer candles, you'll see thousands of them. A lot of them are mine. <laughs> I, I post a lot of this stuff on, uh, on the internet. So type in hammer candles and as crazy as it sounds, man, you can make a lot of money just focusing on those two, right? That's, that's kind of like saying, you can make a lot of money being specialist at something and people go, I don't believe that. It's like, well, Usain Bolt runs very quickly. That's kind of what he does, you know, and he gets paid millions of dollars a year to run very fast. Michael Phelps swims very quickly. I mean, it's kind of it. So there's a lot more to it. It's not just that, right? They have to train, they have to eat, they have to study, they have to put their body through intense, intense conditioning. But that to the extent is really it. So you can focus on a very specific type of candle and a specific type of pattern and become a specialist at that. Because the challenge for most people, Sylvia, in my opinion, is they will look at all of the ways to make money in the markets. I mean, there are literally tens of thousands of them. Strategies, markets. I mean, you got like nine different markets you can trade. People forget bond market all the time bond market is four times bigger than the stock market, right? So you have all of these different types of markets that people can trade. You have all these different ways to trade it. You have all these different ways to make money. It can get overwhelming, but a lot of people will search and search and search. What excites you? What do you understand? What do you get? Trade that. It's pretty much it. And then stick to it for years. I didn't trade anything other than stocks and options for, I would argue, probably seven or eight years. Like I, cryptocurrencies was the only other market that I ever initially started trading. And that was by accident. When I started trading Bitcoin uh, back when I was around $200, like that was, that was by accident. I didn't even want that to happen. It just kind of started happening. And then I found you can chart it and then boom, that kind of went off and that was amazing. So you have uh, futures trading. I've only been trading futures for like two years. So I've been trading cryptos for around four, uh, futures for around two, and stocks and options for about 11. I've never traded Forex. I can chart it, I can help people understand it, I can get people the visual identification of it, but when I do like one-on-one -on -one coaching and stuff, I don't charge that much for, 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 for Forex because I don't trade Forex. So I'm saying, hey, here's all this information that I'm not doing. <laughs> so I'm being honest with them. I don't charge much at all for Forex trading, but hey, I tell it like it is, I'm not trading it. This is how you can trade it. This is the analysis behind it. Hammers work very well. High wave candles work very well in any market. So that's really what I like to look for is just two main types of candles, really getting focus on those and being able to see them. And when you see a good one, I still get as excited now as I did five years ago. When I see the perfect trade, uh, I get in and I play it hard and it's great. All right, Nisam, um, are you in a position to like share your screen and then also visually take us through like how you pick your best stocks for the day so that we also have a better understanding of what you're talking about? 
and then also maybe tell us it will also give us insights into how your live webinar normally works and your open house uh, i have i have two different ways of oh man we're gonna we're gonna have to talk about apple today um i have two different ways i like to find stocks and i will certainly give both of those away for all those who are listening let me just sign into my actual profile really quick i hope the password and email works come on be the right one yeah <laughs> all right that never works the first time i always get pumped up okay so there's two schools of thought and the first school of thought I'm going to do is going to be the easiest one. Um, so when I say school of thought, I mean just purely looking at one set of stocks and tickers all the time. Now, I know that sounds dumb, boring, lame, and pathetic, but that is a really useful way to, number one, make it easy for you. Number two, reduce stress and anxiety. Number three, help you become more proficient, more proficient as a trader. I mean, there's on and on and on. I can go down the list. You want to pick stocks that are easily tradable, right? They have high liquidity. They have high volume and you're not really specifically stressed out about getting filled right? The bid and the ask is very good. They're a volatile company. They move a lot. Apple is one of them. So I know you guys all talk about Apple. I love Apple. I mean, I probably bring up Apple in every interview I ever do, but Apple is a good company because it trades a lot. It has insane volume. It has very tight spreads, extremely liquid. It has weekly options. Uh, you have so many ways that you can trade Apple. And I just like focusing on uh, two types of setups. Like I mentioned, you focus on a select group of stocks that you watch all the time. And when you watch those stocks all the time, you become ingrained by what they're doing. You almost know what they're going to do. You have a really good idea and understanding of what likely is about to happen on your particular stock. So on Apple, for example, check out this hammer candle right here. So that is the perfect hammer. That is your quintessential, gorgeous textbook for everyone who's watching. Again, this could be Forex, this could be stocks, it doesn't matter. October 31st, 2019, that is the hammer of Thor, okay? You have everything about that hammer is ridiculously splendid. And you're talking about getting in above the high of that candle right there with the stop loss below that candle. So you're getting into Apple at 250. Well, it hit 325 yesterday. That's a $75 move per share. You buy one share, you made 75 US dollars. If you made 10 shares, 750 US dollars. 1,000 shares, 75 grand. It's, it doesn't matter how many shares you buy. I mean, it's Apple. It could sustain as many shares as you want. There's a really, really nice high wave candle, uh, sorry, hammer candle. And then we got a really nice high wave candle yesterday. So it's really kind of perfect for me. So this is what I like to do. As I mentioned, I'll share both of them with you, but this is my first most easiest way to trade is find a group of stocks and just trade those same stocks every day. And I can give you, I can give you a list. I mean, th this is a really good list of stocks to focus on. Let's go. Um, Apple, Facebook, Baba, Micron, AMD, Square, Nike. Okay. You, fo you focus on those stocks every day, nothing else other than those stocks every day. And that's all you do. You can become a millionaire. It's possible. It's legitimately doable. You focus on the same stocks all the time, every day, you're going to have a really good idea for what they do. So what's really great is Apple right now is at uh, is a high wave candle at an all time high after earnings. And check this out, Sylvia, ready for this? This is like the best day ever for this interview. Apple is gapping down. So before the market is open, so that we still got two hours before the market open, I can see, you can see, we can all see that Apple is actually gapping down before market open 1%. So I can see that now. 
And what I'm really interested in is playing Apple bearish today because it's gapping below the low of yesterday. That's it. So it's gapping below the low of yesterday. You had a high wave candle at an all time high. I think a lot of people bought Apple yesterday and I think those people are gonna be a little bit trapped and I'm expecting a little bit of selling at some point today on Apple and maybe for the next few days and weeks. So I'll be looking at playing puts and expecting a little bit of bearish opportunity on Apple for the next, like I said, few, few days or weeks. So that's really number one. Number one is I focus on the exact same stocks all the time. Uh, and I just repeat that list over and over and over and over and over every single day. Number two, you can simply scan for gaps. So you can build a scanner and there are truly a, an endless amount of scanners. The scanners are the least of your concerns. So for example, here's a stock screener right here. So you can screen through TradingView, you can screen through your brokers, you can screen through trade ideas, uh, Twitter. So uh, I had a person in the chat pane says, what's your favorite source of stock news and stock analysis? Twitter. Twitter is the only news source that I read because I get so many variants, uh, various pieces of information. And I can do it very quickly. Uh, so I am, I am on Twitter and Instagram if anybody wants to follow me. But uh, the Twitter, Twitter is interesting because again, you get so many good pieces of information. You can follow people on the left, people on the right, conservative, Republican, liberal democrat green party whatever you can follow technical analysis fundamental analysis. there's all kinds of people you can follow so i like using twitter for my stocks um there's, there's some good stuff to scan on there as well but stock screeners are abundant that's the really really easy thing to do but i can show you one that i like using it's called finviz.com so finviz is free and what i'll do right now uh, for everyone looking is i'll kind of show you you can click screener right here so we go into screener and you can go to technical analysis and you can go to candlestick and type in hammer and you got 187 stocks that you can look through that have a hammer right my favorite candlestick strategy and you can always adjust this a little bit if you want so you can go um you know rsi so let's say rsi again if you're really technical specific you can go it's oversold so it's around 30. So now you have a hammer at a low price and boom, you got, you got five stocks. <laughs> All right. So you can go through these five stocks to see if there's any ones that you specifically like. So let's kind of go start with FRBA. It looks kind of interesting. FRBA, First Bank, Williamston. So you have, you definitely have a hammer. Here it is. Now, this is not my favorite hammer. It's an okay hammer because I mentioned, uh, if you remember, Sylvie, that I wanted a little bit of a bigger candle body and I also wanted an upper shadow. So this particular candle doesn't have any upper shadow at all, which is fine, but you know, no specific upper shadow. So I'm not blown away by that. But check this out right here. That's your high wave candle. This is also a high wave candle. This is also a high wave candle. This is also a high wave candle. So you can see firsthand, I, I've never looked at the stock in my entire life, but you could have played some of these moves again with whatever time frame you wanted. You had high wave candle with high wave candles, so back to back high wave candles. So you're probably gonna be playing that thing bearish if it goes lower and bullish if it goes higher. Well, it went down. So you're probably playing it on the downside and you know that you would have been up on this trade. So now you have a hammer candle. You can literally Boom, my scan's done. I can look for this stock to go higher today or the next two or three days based on that one candle. And if it starts going higher, I can zoom into a smaller time frame, like a five minute chart, and start playing that particular stock on a day trade. Uh, let's go look at another one AMNB. AMNB, American National Bank Share. So another bank. We got another bank on our hands and we got another hammer. This one, here we go. Look at that, how quick. That's my perfect hammer right here. Perfection in the bottle. That's it. So again, 
doing this scan, the one that I just showed you, you, you can pull up hammers, get really good at seeing the ones that you like. You got a little bit of a double bottom coming in right here. You had a nice little gap up, nice hammer, good upper shadow. That would have been a really fun stock to watch for a day trade the next day. And look at that. Boom. That was in one day. One day. So you're talking about a $1 move per share on the day. So you're zooming into that. You're playing that on a five minute chart. Uh, I mean, again, you can buy a hefty amount of shares or you can buy one. Doesn't matter. But that was a really good move. And so that's really kind of in essence, Sylvia, how I scan is I will look for simple patterns and I can just scan for them using many various different outlets. But for a lot of you, you can just use Finviz because it's free. Okay, Jeremy, um, maybe you can, I will give this chance to my colleagues to do a follow up questions on your presentation. Sure. On candlesticks as well. Bring so Dennis, no, just ask something. So someone said, do you have any sort of digitalized asset watch list? So I'm assuming that's kind of like a uh, cryptocurrency watch list. And the answer is not really. I just, I just trade the, the main big ones. Um, that's really all I do with cryptocurrencies. So I just trade Bitcoin. So I have, I'll show you my, uh, uh, the stocks that the cryptocurrency, sorry for stumbling the ones that I am personally invested in. I have Bitcoin and usually what I do on Bitcoin is when it gets into a, when it gets into a level or some type of support resistance level that I like, I just kind of start buying some. So here's the weekly chart and uh, look at this candle. Does this look familiar, Sylvia? Yeah. Look at this guy, boom. So you got a hammer candle on a weekly chart and it's at a long-term moving average. So it's at the 100 simple moving average. So I was like, man, this seems like a really good spot to kind of buy some. So I did, uh, I was buying some in through here. And again, not tons. But a few thousand dollars here, a few thousand dollars there, slowly adding to it. And, you know, right now it looks really, really good. So that's cool and everything. Uh, so I own, I own Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, and Dash. Those are my four main ones right now. Uh, my biggest holding is Ethereum. Um, I think it's either Ethereum or Bitcoin. It's going to be very close depending on what, you know, what the day looks like. But this is Ethereum, and again, here's your hammer candle on a weekly chart right here. This was a high wave candle. This is also a high wave candle. This is also a high wave candle. So again, you got a few variants, uh, variations of that. And I'm just kind of looking for this thing to bounce a little bit. Uh, the daily chart, so here's the daily. And again, really good volume. So I love, love, love Sylvia looking for volume. I can go pull up some Forex stuff too in just a second if you guys want. But uh, yes, really please. good, really good breakout, good rotation, really good, ro you know, really good buy the dip opportunity. Because that's one thing that I will say works in any strategy is when you have tons of volume like this, a lot of traders go, oh man, volume is increasing. Let me buy the breakout. So they get in up here. Well, the thing is, <laughs> usually if you have tons and tons of volume, that means that there is a lot of people buying. So if you have tons of people buying, what are they going to eventually do? Well, they're going to sell. So if they sell, it's going to cause that little rotation to come in, right? Which is where I try to get in on the pullback. So I usually call this pattern the S curve. And I try to get in somewhere over here rather than trying to get in somewhere up here. So that's just kind of like one of my approaches in the market. That's what I, what I strive for. Uh, what Forex pair do you want me to look at, Sylvia? Uh, we do currency instruments, mostly on the major pairs, as well as the exotic pairs as well. What would be one of those tickers? Let's say US dollar. Yeah, Euro dollar. Euro dollar. All right, let's go check this bad boy out. US dollar, Euro. Let's go snag it and see what we got. All right, so this is a daily chart. Let's just go look at a weekly. I like looking at weekly charts just to see what the trend is doing. Right, like what's the what's the big trend? What's kind of happening? What does it look like? And I just kind of zoom out a little bit. So from here, all I'm gonna do, Sylvia, is go, all right, 
This is a weekly chart. What is the big resistances and supports? So I have a resistance here. I have a support here. And what I'm doing is I'm looking to the left. I'm not looking at where it's at now. I'm looking back over here. Uh, I'm looking back in this zone. This is all I'm doing right now is I'm focusing all of my eyes from this part of the screen to the left. Because I don't wanna see, I don't want my brain to be impacted by what it's doing now. I wanna see what it did then and then go, okay, cool. So based on that, what's it gonna do now? So we, now that we have those lines on the chart, um, I'll go ahead and just draw them in uh, manually. So let's go ahead and pop those in really quick. So give us a line there and I'll give us a line there. All right, so those are kind of like our main support resistance lines. And then from there on a weekly chart, I'll go to a monthly chart as well. Again, big, big picture, just to kind of see what it's doing. And for right now, it seems like this thing's in an uptrend. So we have a little bit of an uptrend going on. We're above the 100 and the 200 simple on the monthly chart. We're above it on the weekly and we're above it on the daily. That tells me that I'm only gonna to look to play this thing bullish. So weekly and daily, yep. So we're above all moving averages on all time frames. So I'm only looking at playing this thing bullish. So that says, that to me says at this particular juncture, I would not be buying up here. Obviously one could look to short. I know Forex again, you can go in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. But for me, I'm looking at this particular pattern and what I'm now gonna do on a daily chart is figure out now that I know my direction. So I talked about my direction being bullish. Now that I know that, now I simply look for places to buy. And, what, and the way I do that, does it have, you don't have to use moving averages at all to figure out where to buy. What I'm gonna do is look for where are people gonna be losing money? So what that means is I think a bunch of people have stops somewhere over here. That's what I think. I think if they got in bullish, up here somewhere on a daily chart that they might probably have their stops somewhere in there, right? Based on the candlestick, based on the gap, all that stuff. So what am I going to do? That's where I'm going to buy. I'm going to set an entry right here. And that entry is based off of this double bottom neckline. It's based off of some of this support resistance over here. And it's just also kind of right in line with where a lot of people will get stopped out. And it's buying a little bit on the low side. So that would mean if we get something like this, boom, 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 and we get a pullback, right? That would be that pattern that I just drew for you, Sylvia. Sylvia, that would be like that low level. That would be me getting in at a lower price. What a lot of people stress out about regarding a, straight, a strategy and a setup like that is they say, how do you know it's gonna bounce? I mean, you don't, you don't know anything in the markets. So your goal is to go, all right, this is where I want to get in. This is why I want to get in there and then know how much are you going to lose if you're wrong and then know how long you're going to hold the trade. If you're right, have all of that plan in the future and you do it. And that's pretty much it. So yeah, Euro dollar, uh, I would probably look to buy, you know, buy a dip and again, for my scalpers or my really short-term traders, this is like a five-minute chart. I'd probably look to short on some kind of pullback, most likely. Um, again, there's your there's a hammer candle right here on a five-minute time frame. So five-minute, really nice hammer, and uh, yeah, it looks pretty toasty. Okay, Jeremy. Um, thank you, thank you for that demonstration. Um, there is a question that I would want to ask about uh, risk management. So how do you manage risk when it comes to trading stocks? And typically, what, tag, what normally are you targeting when you are looking at your risk to reward ratios? That's a really good question, man. And I'm, I'm so happy that you asked because that really is a massively important key aspect of trading, right? Risk mitigation, risk management. So let me kind of talk through uh, two aspects of my risk mitigation. Um, Here's aspect number one is, I'll, again, I'm gonna come back over to Apple for just a second. So one of my risk parameters says, if I like a company a lot, I know exactly how they make money. I use their products all the time, which again, everything in my house is Apple. 
uh, I use their products. I interact with the company. I like their mission statement, so on and so forth. I want to own some shares. So when I own some shares, when I own a piece of the company, um, that particular risk, I will just buy it. And I know in my head, okay, this could go to zero. So I go, this could go to zero. I don't want it to, but I have one month for it to go higher. So normally when I buy a longer term investment, I, I do what's called scaling in. So when I buy a long term investment, I scale in. A lot of people will just take all their money and throw it in. I scale in. So scaling in oftentimes is buying 10 or 20 shares every week. Now, again, these numbers can be bigger or smaller depending on your account size, but I, I truly believe that this is a phenomenal way to grow wealth is to own companies. So 10 to 20 shares every week. Um, you just keep slowly buying and buying and buying. And then after, again, after a month, you get to say, all right, well, how is this trade working? Is, it tra is, it, is the stock up? Is it performing well? Am I up on my investment? And if you are, then you can start getting in and start piling in a little bit stronger. Um, and you can start adding more and more shares. And then you hold those shares, again, to a really, really reasonable spot. I use uh, protective puts. We talked about put options earlier. I use put options instead of stop losses, instead of stop losses uh, for my investment. So again, if it's a long-term company that I'm like, I wanna be in this to win this. I wanna own some of this company. I wanna make a lot of money over the long term. I use protective puts instead of stop losses because it provides me the opportunity that just in case one of one of these happens on let's say apple right one, a dip like this or a dip like this or a dip like this or a dip like this i don't get quote unquote stopped out right i don't get out of the trade i don't exit the trade um instead of getting out i would just simply use protective puts and be able to leverage that position so that i don't i don't get what what a lot of people refer to as whipsaw now, again, that's just in my long-term trades. I understand that whipsaws are going to happen in short-term trading, and sometimes there's not really much you can do about it. So what I'm going to do now, my friend, is kind of answer your question uh, about risk mitigation on smaller time frames. So I'm going to zoom into a five-minute chart on Apple and kind of show you guys how a lot of people played Apple yesterday in the morning day trading room. And uh, I'll kind of show you really quick the pretty basic setup and strategy. But again, Sylvia, do you remember this pattern? So that's yep. the pattern that I try to play as frequently as I can. And look at this, right? Uh, that's really it. Like I want, I want the stock to go up. I don't want to buy high when there's tons and tons of volume, right? So we talked about that earlier, huge volume coming in. This is really important friends, tons of volume. A lot of people are buying up there. That's not really where you want to buy. You want to wait for that retracement to come in. And as that pullback, as that retracement starts coming in, you're looking at buying lower. So you buy low, sell high. And this is how I would normally do it is uh, I'm looking for a high wave candle, which is kind of that. And then check this out. You got a hammer candle right here. So you got a high wave candle. You got a hammer. Can Those are my two favorites. It's like, okay, cool. Two favorite candles on my favorite company after a pullback. Sounds good. So this would be an entry. Uh, entry would be here and a stop loss would be here. And this is how I calculate risk, my friend. And again, that's a really good question. So number one, how much money do you want to lose on any given trade? So that's number one is you should have the answer to that question. And that question should stay the same for quite some time. So it should stay the same for months at a time. So let's just say it's 200, $200 or 200 euros or 200 yen or whatever, whatever it is, come up with your amount of money. How much is it? If it's $2, $1, whatever it is, you got to come up with a number and then, and then figure out some math. And the cool part about this is this is like really, really basic math five, six, seven, eight year old can do this type of math. So how much money do you want to lose on a trade? Very frequently, that is a percentage of your portfolio. 
So your portfolio, let's just say, is $20,000, all right? Most people go with the 1% rule. 1% of your portfolio um, should be, can be risked. So 1% of your portfolio or less. Now, uh, that's just on each trade. So that doesn't mean that at any one given time, you should only have 1% of risk. That just means on each individual trade, that's a way to do it with very short-term trades. All right. So from here, $200, 1% of your portfolio, you're going to do a math. Entry, 323.25, which is based on candles. Then you subtract your stop loss, which was 320.79 in this particular example. So your entry minus your stop loss. I'm going to have to do some math really quick. 323.25. Minus 320.79 is $2.46. So this is what's called your stop value. And once you have your stop value, then you divide it. So your risk, right? Your risk, which is $200 divided by 246. And that's going to give you the amount of shares that you should buy in this particular instance to only lose $200 on the particular trade which would be 81 shares. Most people will just buy 200 shares and go, all right, cool, this is what I'm gonna do. But that's not exactly how you wanna play it. Thank you, thank you very much for that. It was quite a good presentation. And um, are there any risks that are associated when it comes to using a gap strategy, for instance, or does not getting filled when the markets are volatile and they gap up? Any risks, such kind of risks? Yeah, that's a really good question. So pretty much your main question was, what are the risks for having stop losses? And, you know, the market can obviously move and do something crazy or against you, or you can get whipsawed out. I mean, the number one, the number one risk of having a stop loss, I would say is definitely getting whipsawed, right? That happens pretty frequently where you have a stop in place. Uh, so let's just say you have a stop right there and you know you're in the trade and it's doing one of these things and then bloop, and then it bounces and runs higher that happens to people all the time and there's no real way to avoid that it's just it's part of the game that's like saying if you guys play football um hey don't get tired <laughs> it's like well wait a minute if i'm playing football i'm probably gonna get tired at some point it's like nope can't ever get tired well all right the, the thing is, this is going to happen. This is part of the game. There are ways to avoid it. Like I said, you could use puts. But a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll move their stop. They'll move it down. And you don't really want to do that because when you move it down, what if it's one of those situations where this is happening? Because the stocks can drop for quite some time. And it's right at right when you get to maximum pain, which is normally right here, when you've lost tons and tons of money, that's when you'll exit and then the stock will bounce because it knows, right? This happens in Forex. This happens in every type of market. That's just the way it works. Unfortunately, the markets are designed to fool most people most of the time. So in this environment, kind of in this world and in this approach, what we really want to consider and think about and keep in mind is the number one risk of having stops is yes, you can get stopped out. Uh, there are chances that a stock can gap against your stop loss. That is absolutely uh, possible. So let's go look at a, a real life example here on Momo. So Momo, this is a, a, a swing trade that I got into uh, the other day. And right now, Momo is gapping down to $29.88. Uh, and my stop loss is at $29.54. Now that means that the stock can gap down if it gaps down below, because again, right now it's at 29.88. So if it opens below 29.54, let's say something really, really bad was happening. It was gapping down to 25, right? At market open, I would be selling down here. And again, I would definitely be taking a sizable loss if that happened and it would kind of suck. And I'd be a little bit upset about it and you know, it'd be frustrating. 
But that's, again, part of the game. It's going to happen. It's going to happen very rarely if you do not hold a trade over earnings. So go ahead and write that down. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening, if you're trading stocks, just make sure to verify when earnings are going to be because I generally do not hold a swing trade over earnings. If it is an investment, I have to hold over earnings because there's four a year. But if it's a short-term swing trade, I do not hold over earnings because you're absolutely right, my friend. You can get big, big gaps over stop losses. It gaps down, it stops you out, and then it will run higher almost all the time when it gaps really large like that. So it can happen and it will. It'll happen at some point in your trading, but hopefully it won't be a very big gap. Most of the time, you know, it'll open down here, down here. And again, you'll lose, but it won't be a disastrously horrible loss. But the stops are very similar to having a brake in your car, right? Having brakes in your car, when you're driving down the road, you initially don't want to be in that bumper to bumper traffic, but you're very thankful that your brakes work because if they don't, you're going to end up in a much worse situation than just being stuck in traffic. And that's kind of the whole thing with stop losses is it's a good thing to have a stop loss. It's like a brakes to your car. It's not something you should be stressed out about. Okay. Thank you for that. Yeah. So, um, one, one, one of the concerns when it comes to trading stocks, um, is that sometimes you, your orders get front run by high frequency traders. Have you ever experienced that? Uh, good question. I mean, yes. So the high frequency trading, I think impacts people on such a small level. Um, because here's, here's really what most people are concerned about with high frequency trading. Most people say high frequency trading, run my stops, run my stops and stop everyone out. One, every one out and then it moves. I was like, okay, here's the thing. If we know this to be a potentiality in life, if we know that this is, is happening or could happen or is likely to happen, then why don't we do that? So what I, what I mean by that statement is enter where everyone stops are, right? Like if high frequency traders do it, then you can do it. I mean, they're built by humans. And here's the other interesting thing is many people talk about high frequency trading and how it impacts the market and how profitable they are. But very few people ever talk about how high frequency trading firms and hedge funds shut down all the time, right? They're not always winning. Trust me, they spend tons and tons of commissions. They spend loads and loads of money. Sure, some of them work, but not all of them. In fact, about half, right? So a lot of high frequency trading firms, they end up losing money just like the retail trader because they're trying too hard, they're making it too difficult. So if you are concerned with or worried about or kind of frustrated about having your stop loss get run on a particular trade, you're absolutely right. Like I said, it's gonna happen. There's no question about that. So my theory is, place your entry where the stops are going to be. Uh, for example, let's say MGM Resorts. So MGM Resorts, day trade yesterday. Uh, here's your hammer candle, Sylvia. It's now her now favorite, her now favorite candle. But you got two hand hammers back to back, right? So big, nice move, good run up. And a lot of people are going to get in here and they're going to put their stop loss, you know, right here. It's like, all right, well, if you put your stop loss right there, there's your high frequency trading firm right there, flashing it down, like you said, my friend, and stopping you out and then running. I was like, okay, well, if you know that that's likely gonna happen, instead of entering on this candle, right, put your, put your entry below that candle where you think the stop losses could be, and then put your stop loss down here. And then again, is it possible that it does this? And the answer is, again, yes. <laughs> But I have a really good example, man, of getting stopped out of a trade that I did not want to get stopped out of and then being very happy that I did a few days later. So this is a, a company called 3M. You guys probably heard about this company, but they make paper, all right? They make those sticky notes. They do a lot of, a lot of, a lot of things. So I day traded 3M on this day right here. So I'm gonna zoom in and show you um, the trade that I took. So here is the three minute chart. I'm just gonna zoom into that particular day. All right. 
Because again, man, this is a wonderful, wonderful example of not wanting to get stopped out of a trade, but getting stopped out anyway. Now, I want you all to know that I did not buy right here. Okay, I didn't buy there and get stopped out there. So stop there, enter there. I didn't do that. I actually did buy on the pullback. So I got filled on the pullback. My entry was again, where everyone stops were down here. This was my entry and my stop loss was down here. So I got filled, almost got stopped out. It bounced, it came up, boom, and then bang, I got stopped out. And I was like, shoot, man, because no one likes losing, right? I get it, it's just part of trading. It's part of human psychology. We're not created to be good losers. We're not built to lose often. All through our lives, very rarely do people go, hey man, you lost, congratulations. What an awesome person you are, right? Losing is something that does not happen to us naturally. So therefore, it always makes us upset. So when I'm seeing the stock bounce a little bit over here, I go, man, I can't believe I got whipsawed, right? And then the stock goes down a little bit lower and I go, okay, maybe I'm really happy that I didn't, you know, that I had my stop. And then it bounces again on the double bottom. I go, man, I can't believe this thing's gonna run higher and I get whipsawed out of the trade. And then eventually, uh, <laughs> and then the next day, boom, right? Just going low. Oh my gosh, the thing is crushing. And then the next day, bang, it just keeps going. So granted at the time it was terrible, but if I had held that stock, I would be down so much more than I was when I lost on the trade. And that's, I guess, hopefully a little bit of an answer to your question, bud. Um, you're absolutely right. It's annoying, it's scary, it's frustrating. It really frustrates me. It gets me mad when I get stopped out. So what I try to do is I try to buy where everyone's stops are going to be. And then I still set a stop loss if it's a short-term trade. Thank you, thank you very much for that, Jeremy. And um, one more question from me is, um, when it comes to trading US equities, what is the minimum amount of capital you recommend someone to start with? And uh, do, you, do you get leverage when you're trading US equities from your brokers? It's a very good question. So what's the minimum amount of money? So one thing, uh, which is really cool, money grows on trees, guys. Right. Don't let anyone tell you it doesn't. Money grows on trees. Like it is, it's a fact. Because if you open up a margin account in the US, you automatically get one to two leverage. Now, I'll make sure I say this very clearly, right? If you have one to two leverage, that means you can win, but you can also lose double fast. It's a double-edged sword. It's very, very sharp, but if you swing it too hard, it can cut your arm and make you sad. So when you have one to two margin, if you put in, let's say $3,000, money grows on trees, boom, you actually got $6,000. <laughs> so I normally recommend starting with at least $3,000 US dollars and using some margin. So what I mean by some margin is if you have $3,000 and you really have $6,000, don't use all six. Don't use all six, especially when you start out. But go in and buy maybe $3,300 worth of a company. So again, a good company that you know how they work, you understand how they work, you get how they make money, you use their products, you like them. Buy them at a good price, look at the chart, buy it low. Buy $3,300 worth and wait for it to go up to a level that you wanna sell at. And then when you sell there, then you sell. And here's what's crazy, all right? So let's say you take 3,300 and 3,300 turns into 10% more, so you get 3,600. So you sell, right? And when you sell and you lock in your profit, if you made a $300, if you made a $300 gain on that particular position, right? 3,300 turned into 3,600. Well, now you have $3,300 in your account because you made $300 on the trade. So you invested, right? You invested 3,300, 3, but you made $300 on the trade. 
So with your particular trade, now your, your margin increases again, and then it increases again, and then it just keeps going. And eventually, like if you get $4,000, uh, now you have eight grand to trade with. And the more experience you have, right, the more growth you have over time, as the number gets bigger, it starts compounding and really, really growing. And then if you get over $25,000 uh, here in the States, if you live in the US, this is how much money you have to have to day trade, right? That's how much money you have to have to day trade. And day trade is classified by three round trips in a five day period. So a round trip is just you buy and sell the same stock on the same day. So three round trips in a five day period, you need 25 grand in order to do that. Uh, so that's something to know. And again, that's just a, uh, a rule for those who trade in the U S if you trade outside the U S you might not have that rule at all. But what's really interesting is if you have a margin account in the U S and you're over 25,000, check this out, Sylvia. It's so cool. You actually get one to four leverage for your day trades. Really, really sexy. So if you have, let's say $30,000 money grows on trees, ladies and gentlemen, you get $120,000. That's insane. $120,000 to day trade with. That's really, 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 really cool. So the answer is yes, I absolutely use leverage. I love using leverage, but I still apply that risk management technique and principle that you used earlier to my base account, to the actual amount of cash that I have on hand. I don't take 1% of my massive margin value. I take 1% of my cash value and I just use the margin to take more trades. So that's a very, very good question. I hope I answered it. Yeah, yeah, you did. And, and thank you for that. And um, clearly, uh, the, 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 the listeners have gotten to know the fact that leverage can be a double-edged sword. And um, Jeremy, typically, what's your uh, returns? What, what kind of returns do you target uh, per month? Do you target returns per month or uh, in one business quarter? Really good question as well. So what kind of returns do I target? Um, my goal is 10% a month. That's really what I, what I try to strive for uh, right now. But again, I've been doing this for 11 years. So when you, when you first start out, I would say really aim for two to 4% a month. That's reasonable, it's realistic, it's doable, it can absolutely happen. And two to 4% a month is still quite good. I mean, if you're doing 4% a month, that's 48% a year. If you don't pull any money out, I mean, compounded, that can be insane. This is what I try to obtain. It doesn't always happen, but this is, that's just one of my goals. Um, and that's, that's a combination of many things. So this 10% a month, right? This is a combination of many, many things. This is day trades, swing trades, option trades, long-term investing. This is a nice blend. I really strive for 10% a month and I don't always get it by any means, but sometimes I do. And when I do, it gets really exciting, but it's, uh, it's obtainable. And that's kind of my goal as a, a short term trader. You are always going to have three really big struggles. Uh, struggle number one, overcoming taxes. <laughs> okay. Cause you got to pay taxes. Apparently if you make money, man, that sucks. But well, you got to pay taxes. So pretty much 30% gone out the window for the most part. So whatever money you make, you know, you can, if it's short-term capital gains, let's just, you, you put 30% away. So you already got that to overcome. All right. So then you have to worry about paying your bills. Oh no, we have bills. All right. So not only do you have to make enough to cover your taxes to some degree, at some point in time, you got to pay those things, but you also have to have to make enough money to pay your bills. Because if you trade full time, and you're doing this for a living, well, you know, bills still come around. Or, you know, it doesn't even have to be bills. It could be investment opportunities. It depends on how much money you're talking about here, but you're gonna have to pay for something at some point. And then you have the other challenge of account growth. And account growth is growing your actual, well, account, your portfolio in addition to putting money away for taxes, to paying your bills, and still working on actually growing your overall big account, that is the challenge. And for me, I try to get this guy, I try to get the actual account 
growth at two to three percent a month. Uh, and I don't month I don't monthize that. I annualize it. I don't think monthize is a word, but I'm gonna make it one. So I don't worry about that every single month, but that's usually an annual thing. Is if I can look back and go, okay, cool. My overall big account on an annualized basis grew about 36% this year. I'm usually pretty happy with 24 to 36% throughout the entire year as my ex actual large account growing after all of this happened. And again, sometimes it can occur. It definitely occurred in 2019, but some years it doesn't. And I think uh, 2015 and 2014, it didn't. 2016, 2017, it did. 2018, it did not. And 2019, it did. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you again. Now, um, one, one of the guys is asking whether you have a stock valuation model when you want to buy a stock, telling whether um, a stock is overvalued or undervalued. And if, if I might, might add on, do you also um, consider the valuation of a stock, especially when you're buying stock for your 401k or you just index? That's a great question. And it's Honestly, it's a huge question because the valuation of companies, man, the amount of books that have been written, right? The amount of, uh, the amount of information that's on that topic, I would, I would have to say that what I'm about to say has no bearing on if it's actually true or not. But my personal belief is as a consumer of a product, I'm going to know if this company is a good company or not. So if I stop liking this company and I dislike it and I don't use it for some particular reason, then I will stop being an investor. Uh, let's just look at the chart of Google, for example. So has anyone here not used Google recently? <laughs> and the answer is probably not. So for me, if you're bullish on the internet, you have to be bullish on Google. So until I use another search engine, I would tell people to continue investing in Google. Uh, until another search engine just comes and I, I and find it far superior, far faster, better returns, things of that nature. Um, until one third of the planet stops getting on Facebook and Instagram, I will think that Facebook and Instagram is no longer a good investment. But I think buying Facebook at 198 is a no brainer opportunity at this point. Um, based on again, technicals. So the overvaluation, undervaluation, I can give you some actual meaty answers. I will give you some meat because I don't want to give you all speculation. One thing I like doing is I do like using Finviz to get me some generic basic ideas of how a company is growing. So let's just go look at LAUR, for example, Laureate Education. This is a company that I found recently and I'm kind of interested um, in this particular company's growth. So there are some numbers and some fundamentals that I do think are relatively important. One of those facts and figures is sales versus market cap. That's kind of a big number. It's, it's very important because if the company's not selling, they're not making money, right? You gotta sell, you gotta make money. Income has to come in. So what's interesting about this one is their sales are 3.2 billion and their market cap is 8.5 billion. Their income is negative, but their entire size of the company. <laughs> that's a really, really good problem to have. All right, that's a phenomenal problem to have for your sales to almost be the entire value of your company on the stock market. I mean, mo for example, Shopify is trading at 40 times sales or something ridiculous. So this stock is only trading at 1.39 times sales. That means if you went out and bought this company, we, we raised four and a half billion dollars. It would take us 1.3 years to pay for our investment just based off sales. So that's a really good number to know. I, I kind of think, I, I kind of, I like to put some value on that one. Uh, and then I like to look at gross margins and profit margins. So obviously that should be self-explanatory. The higher those numbers are, the better. Uh, I really do like to see positive sales numbers in here as well. So I want to see this number increase. 
Um, right now, I don't like the fact that it's, you know, negative. So I'm going to keep a really, really close eye on this company. And as this, as this company increases a little bit um, and starts going higher, I will like this company even more. But this is just one example of valuations is I do want to look at a company and I want to make sure that they are still making money. Um, let's go look at Apple, for example. So Apple, right? You have sales quarter to quarter. That's a positive number. Growth, gross margin, operating margin, profit margin, insane for how big this company is, but they're still profitable. Price to sales, 5.4, right? So again, that means that it would take five years for you to you know, make your investment worthwhile. And you have $260 billion in sales. This one's just like a ridiculous, ridiculous model, but there's a lot of other ones that are also quite good. Um, let me go look at another one. Give me six seconds, I'm pulling up a list. All right, so there's another one that I found was INMD. I like this stock a lot based on the uh, based on the fundamentals. And uh, again, price to sales is, is around 10, that's okay. But sales, big green number, gross margins, big green number. So huge, huge fundamentals, very little debt, and you have a short flow to 7%. That means there's some people betting against this company. So. To answer your question, my, my friend, I like to look at sales, gross margins, operating margins, profit margins, price to sales, just to kind of get a general idea if the company's still making money and people like them and people value them. And if they do, uh, I will keep buying them for a while uh, because the gentleman who asked that question also asked about the Dow Jones Industrial. I'll blow your guys' mind for a little bit, especially if you're here and you're young. The Dow Jones industrial average will hit 100,000 in your lifetime. So right now it's at uh, almost, let, let's just say 29,000. Is it judging? Right, but the Dow Jones, uh, let's just say 10 years ago, not even 10 years ago, let's just say five years ago. Five years ago was at 16,000. That means in the last five years, it's almost doubled almost doubled and all it needs to do is double one more time and it will be at 60,000. And then if it doubles one more time, it'll be at 100,000. So that means in the next, what, 40 years, can it double twice? And the answer is yes. So for me, as inflation continues to be a thing and as more people keep buying products and more people keep spending money and more people get excited about the market and you have brokers that are cheaper and you have these international markets, I mean, again, the fact that I'm speaking to incredible, beautiful, smart, energetic human beings in Kenya right now is mind boggling because you have all these worlds and these countries who are participating in the markets and they're putting money every day into the markets. It's going to continue to grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger over time. And it's phenomenal. So yeah, there will be pullbacks. There will be valuation changes. There'll be shifts that occur in the markets. Absolutely. But big picture for me, as long as I'm a, a value believer of their product, I'll keep owning the shares. Okay. So that basically means that you don't believe the market is currently overvalued, that the Fed is responsible for, you know, uh, pumping the stock market up through QE and basically cutting interest rates like they did last year. Because that is what, has, what is being mentioned out there, that this, this a bull run that we have been seeing for the been seeing for the last uh, one decade. It's it's not real. Is that that's not a concern for you? <laughs> it's a good. That's a very good question, man. It's a very good question. Um, we will have a recession. Uh, we will have a depression. The question is just simply when. Um, I think two thousand and eight was a once in a twenty thirty year type of occurrence. I don't think we're going to have another one of those for a very long time. Again, I'm just speculating we could. But at this point, whatever pullback we get on the Dow Jones will get bought up. You know, so if we have a pullback to 26,000, which is 10%, that'll get bought up. 24,000, which is 20%, will get bought up. 30%, uh, which is about 2,200, will get bought up. Those will all get bought up. Those are all dip buying opportunities. We've always had inflation. We've always had a challenge. And America has filed bankruptcy once before. Do you remember when that is? Nope. <laughs> so Amer America filed bankruptcy during the Great Depression in the late 1920s. So we've done it before and uh, it can happen again and it will most likely happen again. And when that occurs, America will enter a depression. 
but it's during these depressionary stages that, I mean, you're young, I'm young. Most young people will be able to outrun it. Uh, realistically, if you are 65, 70, when that happens, it's going to be a little bit of a struggle. So long story short, man, you are absolutely right. There's a lot of reasons and rationales why we can have some pullbacks, but this is what economies are supposed to do. Economies are supposed to grow. They are supposed to scale. Inflationary aspects is just part of life, right? The more humans that come on the earth, the more you have to feed them, the more it's always more and more and more. The number is always bigger and bigger and bigger. So inflation is actually just a natural part of economies of scale. So as this is happening, as you know, again, quantitative easing, Federal Reserve, uh, the Federal Reserve is actually not federal, nor is it a reserve. So it's, it's really interesting what the Federal Reserve actually is. And uh, I, I, I like to think that with whatever quantitative easing and buybacks that they're doing, they're going to keep doing it. They're always going to find ways to prop up the market to a degree, right? The U.S. will always find ways to protect itself in, a, in the case or in, in, the, in the cause or the event of an absolute market collapse. Uh, in fact, I'll go back to, you know, well, let's go back and look at the Great Depression really quick. And before the Great Depression happened, uh, you had an extremely bullish move in the market. And that's what I would like to think is going to happen um, maybe even in the late 2020s, like 2027, 2028. Maybe we repeat this. Maybe it's a 100-year cycle. So you got seven good years left. But it's just going to run and run and run and run and run and get really, really high and then have a massive pullback. You know, whatever it looks like, 40, 50, 60, 80%. Who knows? But when it has this massive pullback, it's, you're still going to have companies. That, that's the thing, man. Like the Federal Reserve can prop up the broader market as much as it wants, but you got to remember, companies still exist. And as long as, a, as long as the companies don't go bankrupt, certain companies, as long as they still make products, as long as people still buy them, as long as people still believe them, the, the worst unemployment rate America's ever seen, I believe, was like 27%. Which, sure, that's high. But if you think about it, that's one out of every four people. Um, you know, I had a board game last night with some friends, and we were sitting around the table, and one out of four people, they, one of that person was unemployed. So it's like, that's going to happen at some point in our lives. I know that. I'm expecting it, and it will occur. But me and you both can make a lot of money when that happens. Right. We can make money on the downside. So it's okay. And then when that downside occurs, maybe in eight, nine years from now, man, I hope you have a lot of cash to buy some really, really good companies that are going to be doing big things because necessity is the mother of all invention. And when the markets crash and crumble and get really depressed, that's when companies become great. That's when companies really innovate. They think through big things and they come up with masterful plans and they, you know, rally the troops and they create new products. And those are really, really good opportunities to buy some big, big name companies. So I'm excited for when it happens. I know the Federal Reserve is propping up the market, like you mentioned, with, with quantitative easing, with federal rates and with interest rates. But what you got to remember is humans still make money. And if that money is real or not is not the question here. But people can still buy products and they can buy shares. And if people keep buying shares, the stocks are going to keep going up. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that, Jeremy. Um, you have really answered those questions very clearly, and um, thank you. So I'm going to, uh, Sylvia is going to take over from me. Perfect. Yeah, but thanks so much, ma'am, for your questions. I appreciate that. Thank you. Hey, Jeremy, thank you. Much appreciated for the wealth of information, and maybe as a uh, just to mention to our attendees, they, the ones that are using Scope Markets, the stocks available for them are European stocks, but they can still use the same strategies that you're teaching us to trade European stocks. Yeah. Very good question. And the answer is absolutely. Um, in fact, I have a lot of uh, traders in India as well. So this is the, the Nifty 50. This is the Indian mark on the NSE. And you can see... Um, the trend looks very similar to the U.S. trends, right? The market looks very similar to the U.S. market. 
uh, and you have, you know, there's your hammer candle right here. Really nice little hammer candle back in September or December. So the answer is yes. It could be European markets. It can be Chinese markets. It can be the Hong Kong exchange. It can be the Indian markets. Um, if your country has a market or has its own exchange, not your country specifically, anyone's, anyone's country, then yes, these type of analysis, risk procedures and thought processes can work in anything. All right. And we really insist on education. So maybe you can tell us besides the book, Money Grows on Trees, which other book would you recommend to the audience when they want to start trading stocks, be it US equities, be it European stocks, which book would you highly advise? Ooh, there is a lot of them. Um, here's one, Money Master the Game uh, by Tony Robbins. That's going to be a must read. That one's very, very good. And then of course you have, let's see, um, one of the other books I would recommend. I mean, I'm just trying to think of so many. I got two or three over here. What will be, I mean, Snowball, you know, Snowball by Warren Buffett. I mean, this guy is what, the third richest person on the planet? Um, Anything, anything by Warren Buffett. A lot of people will say the intelligent investor. It's a hard read. <laughs> um, it's, it's tough. It's tough to get through. But yeah, it's, it's kind of the Bible, if you will. The intelligent investor, not a bad one at all. But Snowball by Warren Buffett, intelligent investor, uh, if you really, really are extremely thirsty for learning. Uh, Money Master of the Game by Tony Robbins is really quite effective. I think that's a great book. Uh, Money Grows on Trees is a great book about money and mindsets. It's not entirely correlated directly to the stock market, but it's a really good, useful, um, a, a useful escape from the status quo of what many people believe about money. So I do totally recommend that particular book as well. And honestly, here's a crazy one. Stock market for dummies is, is quite good. Uh, there's like the, the, for dummies brand, right? They really have everything. It says everything in the world for dummies. Stock market for dummies, I read a while ago, and that one's really quite great. I also like anything The Motley Fool produces, uh, the free stuff. They sell all the time. <laughs> so it's cool and everything, not a big deal, but I do like The Motley Fool. Uh, that was one of the news organizations and publications that got me really interested in the market because they were telling me the why. Right, they were talking about why would a particular stock go higher, and I always appreciate and respect that. So, those are some of my my answers to your question. Okay, uh, so as we conclude, Jeremy, you can talk about your open house, the opportunities for our attendees and other people to join in your live webinar, and also you know talk about the dates as well, because I think you do it twice a year. Yeah, absolutely. And again, for those who are listening in, uh, I hope this is helpful and beneficial. And I appreciate you even bringing that up because you're absolutely right. I do this twice a year. So the next open house event where everyone can be a part of RLT and join and be a part of everything is going to be most likely in July. So this one is ongoing right now. In fact, I will launch. So I'm going, I'm going right from here, right into the morning room. So in, in 28 minutes from this exact moment in time, I will be in the morning room uh, kind of leading over 300 people through the markets and kind of showing them what's interesting, why it's interesting, talking about gaps, talking about what to look for. So that goes on for two more days. So if you're listening in or you're being able to watch this, you got two more days to get into this. Uh, I highly suggest it. I think it's valuable. I think it's worth it. I think you're going to learn something. And again, it's literally free. And if you want to take advantage of the sale opportunity that we have from the free week, you're more than welcome to, but I'll post the link in the chat pane. Uh, Cause again, I will go live in now 27 minutes. So if anybody wants to pop in there again, you're more than welcome to, it doesn't matter where you live. I think some of the information is translatable where you can ask me for a stock. I look at ASS stocks all the time. Um, so this is one like in, in the uh, Australian market that a lot of Aussies have been keeping a really good close track on. This is APN Property Group. So again, I don't live in Australia, but I know a lot of people have been making some good money off this and it's not very expensive. 
I get that. It does kind of move like a penny stock because, you know, the Australian market is just not very liquid. But anyway, the answer to your question is if someone has a stock and they ask me, I can probably pull it up and I can look at it and I can analyze it and I can kind of give you my thoughts on it. And my thoughts on this one have been, you know, moderately bullish for about the last four or five months. So yeah, I think anyone in the world, if you're wherever you're listening from, you can tune in, you can ask questions. I can do my absolute best to help answer them. And that's the free room last until Friday. And then the next time it'll be available will be sometime in July. All right. Maybe you can also mention your website as we conclude. Absolutely. So if you're listening in and or watching this live, I, I was able to build a website about five years ago called reallifetrading.com. And our mission is to enrich lives. We do that by teaching people how to invest properly and safely and profitably in not only the US stock market, but all global markets, just to help them all understand a little bit more about the market and also themselves. Because if you master yourself, you will master the markets. Boom. And Dang. thank you very much. Uh, with that, we conclude. We, we, we look forward to having you in the future. And yes. thanks again for making the time, Jeremy. We're grateful. Goodbye. My pleasure. Thanks, guys, for tuning in and sticking with us to the end. We hope you have learned something new. I would like to appreciate Scope Markets for sponsoring this webinar. Remember, you can open a live trading account with Scope Markets and apply the lessons shared by the guest in this webinar to your trading. Many thanks to our guests for speaking to us. We'll be open to have you in the future. Till next time, goodbye.